Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's officially afternoon, uh, at least here in the central time zone. Um, thanks for joining us. We've got uh, a handful of folks in-house here at uh, Dorsey, Minneapolis, and a lot of people joining us on the web uh, whom we can't see, but we, we trust that you're out there and we appreciate you joining us. Um, I am Andrew Brantingham, and I am a, a trial partner here at Dorsey in Minneapolis and the chair of our healthcare litigation practice group. Uh, and I'm here to welcome you to our CLE today, um, which we are calling the Healthcare Litigation Trends Conference. Um, we're excited to have you. We've got several interesting uh, topics to present to you today. Um, You'll see a uh, an agenda in a minute. I'll talk a little bit more about our speakers and what we'll be addressing. First, um, we will take a little break between two sessions that each should be about an hour. Uh, and here is a little bit of housekeeping information on the deck for you. Um, number one, we will be applying for CLE credit in the jurisdictions listed on the invite. Um, so make sure that you sign in uh, on the web. You can follow up. Uh, to make sure you get your credit. If you're here in person, sign into the sheets on the table. Um, we have a lot to cover today, so we're not going to have really an ability to take Q&A uh, live from the web. If there are questions in-house here, feel free to throw them out. There's not too many people out there uh, who are going to jam up the process. Uh, but feel free to follow up with us by email or reach out to your normal Dorsey contact if you've got one. Uh, if you've got questions after the presentations that you'd like to follow up on, we, of course, would love to address questions and continue to try to, to help uh, provide some information. Um, after today's program, we'll send out a short survey. We'd appreciate your feedback. Uh, and finally, for webinar attendees, uh, the materials are available for download from the reminder email that we sent from events at Dorsey.com. Don't forget to return your completed attendance form to attendance at dorsey.com. There's going to be a verification code announced in the middle of each of the sessions. I'm sure you've been through that before for those states that require it. Um, look for chats with the links to download the sign-in uh, materials and the verification code. Let me now uh, introduce our speakers. And in fact, I'm going to punt it uh, to them to introduce themselves. So we'll start uh, with Becky. I am in the health litigation group. Um, I am in the Des Moines office, but also work with a lot of our colleagues um, across our across the Dorsey platform. Um, I primarily do um, like health litigation, obviously, but a lot of medical staff issues, which is what I'm going to talk about today, as well as um, other uh, litigation type matters for providers, including things like challenging citations and regulatory um, issues and helping providers in front of uh, their licensing boards. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Alan Iverson. I'm a partner in the healthcare litigation group here in Minneapolis. Um, I obviously do healthcare litigation, um, but my practice focuses on um, representation, uh, both of payers uh, as well as providers. Um, so I kind of cover the spectrum. I do everything from medical malpractice actions to complex commercial litigation for large hospital systems. And I also do quite a bit of ERISA litigation as well. Um, and so these issues are near and dear to my practice, and I'm excited to talk about them. Vanessa? All right. Um, I'm Vanessa Schwapsky. Yep, that's how you say my last name. <laughs> um, I'm also a partner in the healthcare litigation group. And um, like Alan, I represent payers and providers, anything from medical malpractice, um, to uh, pharmacy termination claims, general commercial litigation, um, as well as ERISA. Uh, I guess I already introduced myself, but again, I'm Andrew. Um, I I swear to you, I'm in the process of updating that photo from the website that looks like I'm about 24, uh, not 24 anymore. And I, it's coming. I've got a set of new photos that are going to be a little bit more true to real life uh, pretty soon. Um, as I said, I, I am the chair of the healthcare litigation practice group. I do a wide range of litigation in the healthcare industry. A lot of that is medical malpractice defense. A lot of it is, uh, as Alan characterized it, I would say complex commercial litigation, uh, primarily focused on representing healthcare systems, providers, uh, and so on. And um, I guess I'll take a moment just to talk about our group more broadly. Not everyone is familiar with our healthcare okay. litigation practice group. 
the sort of diversity of practices that you see in front of you today begins to, I think, hint at, at the diversity within our group. Alan indicated, you know, Alan works for providers and payors. A, a big chunk of our, our practice group focuses on representing uh, payers in the healthcare industry and all the unique issues that they face. A lot of us work primarily for providers, and many of us kind of do both both sides of things. Um, we've got a wide array of topics today. Um, I think as I look at it, I, I think of these topics as a little bit more of interest um, primarily to healthcare providers and health systems, a little bit more than the payer side of things, but hopefully there are items of interest to anyone who works in this industry. Um, as we put this presentation together, our, our sort of theory of the case, if you will, was to try to come up with a set of topics that we think are of interest to some combination of the many in-house lawyers that we work with, often at health systems or providers, um, who, at least my sense is, y'all juggle a lot of different types of issues. Um, and so each of us is bringing a little bit different kind of a, a focus and a different set of issues to talk about that you know we hope will be helpful in helping you address the kind of new trends and topics that, that crop up in the industry. So uh, with that, um, you've got the agenda slide up in front of you, and we're going to start. Our first hour is going to be Becky and Alan talking about privileging and medical staff issues. That is particularly Becky's wheelhouse. Alan's going to talk about peer review protections. Uh, then we'll take a break, and we'll come back with Vanessa and me talking about some more um, directly litigation-focused topics. So with that, Becky, take it away. Thank you. As Andrew mentioned, we're going to start talking today about privileging and medical staff issues. And so um, I think it's always helpful, at least for me, my brain works with let's start back at the beginning and why do we have medical staff and, and why do we have these processes? And one of the important reasons we have that is because the government requires us to have medical staffs. So this is the condition of participation. So any um, hospital that has uh, that, that takes federal funds um, or participates in federal programs um, is required to have medical staff functions um, and to have bylaws um, that set forth some of these requirements, and that's important to CFR 482.22. Um, this uh, section of the requirements, it really sets forth some pretty broad requirements. You know, you have to have that organized medical staff. You need to have bylaws. Um, who that are approved by the board, so the hospital governing board. It identifies who can be members, but leaves that open a little bit in terms of uh, non-physician practitioners. It talks about the fact that there must be periodic appraisals of the members and reporting on quality to the board. It also talks about that initial admission um, into the medical staff. And then it also identifies, you know, kind of what else needs to be in there with the types of staff, um, and it requires that all of the med staff members be subject to those same bylaws, rules, and regulations. Um, another reason that we have it is because if you want to be accredited, the Joint Commission and, and other accrediting bodies are going to require it as well. So the Joint Commission requires that medical staff take a leadership role in performance improvement. And so that's why we have, I mean, if you step back one step further, the reason we have medical staff is for quality purposes. That's the basis for it. Um, and so the Joint Commission, when they're they're accrediting uh, a particular hospital, they're going to look at these requirements to make sure you have them in place for that quality purpose. So the Joint Commission requirements not only require that leadership role, but they also require that that med staff oversee quality treatment and services, and they require that medical staff to define the circumstances. And in particular, they want you to have a mechanism for taking adverse action, so for addressing quality concerns. <clears throat> Then each state is also going to have some laws relating to medical staff um, based upon licensing. So if you're licensed in Minnesota, this is your um, statute. And I think I got an extra zero in there, it looks like. I didn't catch that typo. But um, so I listed Minnesota and Iowa just because this is a pretty common, these are pretty common statutes basically that you have to have an organized group, that you have to have bylaws. Um, that they're, you know, they have to be admitted through this process. Um, Iowa's has some uh, sort of a list of things that you need to consider or that need to be um, considered when you're admitting someone to your medical staff. Those are things like, can they provide patient care independently? Um, what are the licenses they hold? What's their training experience and competence? Um, what's their, what kind of services do they provide versus what the hospital's currently providing? 
Um, and also, interestingly, Iowa has a cost effective services um, piece to it. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that really finds its way in there, but uh, I don't know that it makes a huge difference in Iowa's medical staff bylaws, but that is an interesting uh, note that they have in there. I also included Alaska's simply because theirs is interesting from the standpoint of it has quite a few details in it in terms of the additional things that need to be in those bylaws. Um, for example, they have specific emergency requirements depending on the type of hospital that you are. If you think about some of these requirements, it makes sense given sort of the rural nature of, of Alaska's um, practice, um, but they have specific provisions regarding mid-level practitioners. They have certain things in there that they say your bylaws need to address with respect to how to obtain medical histories and examinations, uh, when consultation is required, when you have to refer out to a pathologist. Um, so I think the point of this, you know, looking at these obviously is check your state statute, depending on what state your um, hospital is in. And the other one I wanted, the other point I wanted to make is even if you're not a hospital there, you can certainly have a medical staff, even if you're not a hospital. Um, and many do. Obviously, we have surgery centers. Um, I've also seen physician groups sort of create a medical staff type process. Um, these are usually larger physician groups. Um, the reason they do that is to work on quality and to obtain some of the protections that we're going to talk about, primarily the privilege protection that Alan's going to talk about. Um, but I encourage you to check your particular state statutes to determine if there's any specifics that have to be in there and obviously look at your specific type of licensure as well. Um, as you noted in all of these, the medical staff bylaws are a big piece of it. The statutes and the Joint Commission kind of set these outer parameters, but then your bylaws are going to have your specifics. So that is a very critical document. Um, it's going to address your the entry of people into your medical staff. So what are the required credentials? How do they how do they apply? What are you going to look at? They're also going to address the processes when there's trouble. So there's going to be different processes for when you're trying to resolve somebody's um, issues, maybe going through um, a review process before there's an actual hearing. Um, so that's what your medical staff bylaws are going to detail is how you work through those processes. Um, one of the kind of questions that's going on in state law is whether or not medical staff bylaws are, a, are an enforceable contract. Uh, Minnesota state law, there's been um, cases that have said it is. In Iowa, they've said we don't think it is. So that's a little bit different <clears throat> depending on the state. And the reason that's important is obviously that can create claims for physicians if the medical staff bylaws are not followed. It, it creates a breach of contract claim for them if it is deemed to be a contract. Um, it's important to regularly review and update those policies. Um, and obviously, I've seen, you know, every different hospital has something that looks a little different. It's going to depend on the size of the organization. It's going to depend on the location of the organization. Um, but make sure it works for you. You can't really just lift someone else's bylaws and make it work for your organization. Um, I think it's important to... Um, make sure that you're looking at those regularly for the purposes of even if you haven't had a hearing in a while, take a look at it. Does it still make sense? Do you still have the same committees that you were using before? Or if you've had a hearing lately, was there something that went wrong or was unclear or it was sort of confusing in the process? That's the time when you can go back and remedy that and try to make it better for the next process. So this is a good visual, I think, for all the types of things that happen within the medical staff. Um, uh, you might have a focused professional evaluation. You might have ongoing um, professional practice evaluation. These are all things that are going to be addressed um, in those bylaws. So why is it important? Why do we care? Why do we want these processes? Well, the primary issue is immunity. Um, the the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act, and for those of you who are familiar with the National Practitioner Data Bank, that was also the statute that created the National Practitioner Data Bank. Um, but the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act, um, HCQIA, not a very good acronym that rolls off the tongue, but it created immunity. So it allows uh, organizations to talk about quality and to be able to get immunity 
and so that everyone feels like they can talk about quality without the potential of it becoming litigation um, or it being used in litigation against them. So the immunity piece really has to do with the individuals involved in the process. So these are going to be your physicians who, um, you know, you take action against, let's say they've had some really poor quality issues. They go through a medical staff process. They ult You ultimately revoke their privileges. Um, this is going to protect you. This immunity protects the hospital, protects the organization from being sued by that physician. Just like any kind of immunity, it doesn't mean you're not going to get sued by that physician, but it creates um, a protection for claims. There's a couple of exceptions, obviously. Um, civil rights issues are accepted from that immunity. And also, like many of these statutes, if you do something that's malicious or you're providing information that's knowingly false, the other time where you're not going to get immunity is if you don't follow your process. Um, so that's why the bylaws are important. You may look at those bylaws and think, well, that's silly. Why are we doing that? But if you don't follow your bylaws as written at the time that they're in effect, that can be a reason you don't get immunity. So not only do you have to follow the regulations, but you have to follow your own bylaws. Um, there are similar immunity provisions under state law. For example, Minnesota's I have listed there. Um, similar language, it can be a little bit different, but basically immunity if you acted reasonably and not motivated by malice. Um, these are usually obviously rebuttable presumptions. So there's a presumption of immunity and then it can be rebutted by the individual to say, you know, they didn't follow this process or I didn't get the protections that I thought I was afforded under the bylaws. Um, another reason that medical staff processes are important has to do with negligent credentialing claims. And there's kind of a variety of how states address these claims. Generally, they're going to accompany a malpractice claim, and it's going to be a separate claim against the hospital or facility saying, you negligently credentialed this individual. They were a terrible physician or provider, and you didn't take all the steps necessary to protect your patients from this individual, either on the front end by, you know, sort of credentialing them or once they're there and you're not taking action, even though you're seeing a lot of problems. Um, obviously, following good processes and following those bylaws can help set up that defense. The reason that negligent credentialing claims can be um, important and difficult is that um, there are some cases out there where there's been some insurance coverage disputes over whether or not your regular malpractice coverage would cover a negligent credentialing claim. So that gives exposure to the entity, not just um, obviously the physician and the um, insurer. But also, um, it can it basically these cases get bifurcated because there's certain information that you can use and access during the negligent credentialing claim that isn't otherwise accessible during the malpractice part of the claim. So you're essentially ending up with two separate uh, trials. Um, obviously, the medical staff process is important, and I'm sure many of you, that's the whole reason why we you know, have these quality discussions is to be able to engage in this peer review and to have that information be privileged. So Alan's going to talk more um, specifically about that. And again, you know, obviously quality is the whole basis for why these laws were created. And so um, not following your processes is not only problematic from a litigation perspective with the practitioner, but also you're just generally making it riskier for your patients. Um, and it also increases the risk to you, to other providers and other hospital personnel um, if they're, you know, having to deal with someone who is not um, keeping up the quality that is required. There's also just general business reasons. Um, there's, as many of you know, you spend a lot of money recruiting uh, very good, you know, providers. And if you get them in the door and then you realize maybe they have some issues, behavioral or quality, and you're not taking, uh, you know, not walking through those processes that give them the opportunity to rehabilitate and, and improve or change their behaviors, um, you're missing that opportunity and you've made a big investment in them. There's also lost uh, revenue if you get tagged by a, a payer for not being able to bill for the services if they were of substandard quality. Um, bad PR, obviously, these things can get out. Um, and uh, just if you have bad quality going on at the hospital, you obviously are going to get bad PR of that. Productivity losses. We see this a lot, especially with, and I feel like this is a, a something that happens more uh, you have 
providers with a lot of behavioral problems. Um, you know, they're not very nice <laughs> to their colleagues. They're difficult to work with. Um, and you're not sort of taking, you're not following your bylaws to engage in a process with them to try to remedy that. And so then you, you create a very bad culture. And so you have a lot of productivity losses from that dysfunction. And of course, just the litigation cost in dealing with malpractice actions or other issues that can come up from a bad provider. I'm going to talk about a few cases. Um, so one of these is it's actually from the from New Mexico, and it's it's from about 12 years ago, but it's a really good um, case to describe what you should not do um, in a medical staff process. So this hospital, as well as all the doctors who were involved in the peer review process, they lost their immunity under the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act when the physician filed a lawsuit against them and the hospital for damages. The reason they lost that immunity was because they didn't follow their bylaws and they didn't really give the guy due process. So they initially had suspended him temporarily, which is fine. And you don't have to give someone a hearing before a pre deprivation. You know, you, you can temporarily suspend somebody for an emergency issue from from privileges. But if you're not sort of then following that up and completing the process. So here we had situation. I mean, they if they could have made a mistake at every, I mean, they made a mistake at every single step. It wasn't like they made one mistake. <laughs> they made the mistakes all along the way. So one of the things they did um, was they just didn't give the guy a chance to talk to them at the beginning. They didn't go to him and say, look, you, we've had these three bad outcomes. What's going on? Give us your, give us your input. Um, then when it moved forward through the process, uh, the committee recommended one set of penalties, and then when it went up to the next level, there was another set of penalties recommended that weren't even seen by the first group of people. And so there was a change in penalties throughout. They didn't offer uh, the physician the opportunity to really see the evidence or to cross-examine witnesses. Um, and then there was a conflict of interest, which went all the way through the process. I mean, basically they had a, a physician who served as the prosecutor, was on the hearing panel, investigated. He was a competitor. I mean, just everything that you, uh, what not to do happened in this case. So if you want to know all the things you should not do, good case to read. Um, the next case I have is this a Prairie versus Parkview Health Systems out of Indiana. It's a state court case, but another Kind of, it's a good contrast to the the New Mexico case because this doctor had a lot of problems, but they did a good job of sort of following their processes and procedures, giving him an opportunity to remedy his problems. They they went outside of the organization to get some input on what his issues were. They were doing chart review. And yet he couldn't, the, the issues did not resolve. And so they ultimately said, we cannot review, renew your privileges. Um, that was then went through the regular processes, was concerned, confirmed by the board. The physician sued, but the court said, no, they have immunity. They, they followed the Healthcare Quality Improvement Act. They followed their bylaws. They gave you the opportunities. You cannot sue them for damages. Um, this is a Minnesota case, so in Ray peer review action. This um, one was interesting simply because rather than for rather than suing for damages, this uh, individual sued for injunctive relief to try to stop the hospital from implementing the discipline that the uh, board had approved. Um, so the court held that uh, the health care, the federal immunity provision didn't apply since that matter was for injunctive relief and the health, the federal law only applies to damages actions. However, the court held that the state provision did allow for immunity and extended to injunctive relief. However, the the uh, uh, provider or the the hospital didn't do things the right way, and the language used in Minnesota is malicious. And so they found six procedural regularities and said that if you're willfully violating your own procedures, we deem that to be malicious. Um, it sort of all started at the beginning of this one. Um, the, it, the investigation was initiated by the vice president of medical services. And he sort of went to hospital leadership and said, this physician is disruptive and I think we need to discipline him. He misled. Uh, the investig the the team saying, you know, I've already talked to him about his behavior and he's not changing. That hadn't occurred. 
Um, the peer review investigation followed, but they really didn't dig in and tell him exactly what he was doing wrong. They used these very general uh, statements saying there's overwhelming evidence that you're engaged in this disruptive, demeaning, counterproductive behavior, but gave him no example. So he didn't have a way to respond. Um, and they ultimately said, you know, that's that's not sufficient in order for this individual to be able to respond. Um, and so you don't get the immunity. Um, I've also included an Iowa case, um, and I think this case uh, really shows and brings up the difference between how do you deal with a provider from an employment perspective versus a medical staff process perspective. And, and you can do both, or you can choose one path, um, and there may be different reasons that you want to do that. So here, the hospital had chosen to use the employment process. And so they fired this doctor um, from employment after there were some concerns raised about his um, surgeries and about some prescription irregularities. Um, they did have an outside consultant and do an internal investigation, but they did that all under the employment side of things, not through their formal peer review medical staff process. And this consultant, I mean, they sort of, it seemed like they sort of used a mixed uh, process, but they never really invoked the medical staff process. Um, the hospital did ultimately terminate him, made the report to the National Practitioner Data Bank. Physician sues for defamation. Um, Supreme Court says, you know, actually these statements weren't false. Um, and so they're not defamatory. But they did talk about the fact that, you know, whether or not there would have been immunity for the medical board and uh, National Practitioner Data Bank reporting. And they said they they affirmed where, where the district court had said, you know, we we can't find the immunity. We don't even need to get to the immunity question because you did this through an employment process, not through the medical staff process. So this just raises the issue of maybe you should consider uh, doing things through an employment process or if you have an independent contractor relying upon their contract. If you want the peer review protections and the immunity, you're going to need to use that formal medical staff process and your bylaws rather than an employment process. So, Becky, some, I have a yeah, question for you. Yes. <laughs> um, can you put just any type of issue into the peer review process, or is there a limit to what you can put into it to get immunity? Um, I mean, it, typically, I mean, always, it always has to come back to quality. But behavioral issues often impact quality. So we often see some of the behavioral issues getting fed through the medical staff process. And generally, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, if you're having some behavioral issues, often there's a quality issue that goes along with it. I've not really seen a question when it comes up in that that there's one that doesn't fit. It's, it's relatively broad. Um, as long as you can connect it to quality in some way, you can make it go through the medical staff process. Um, so some key takeaways, obviously, you want to ensure that your medical staff bylaws are meeting your conditions of participation and any other requirements that you're subject to. You want to make sure that your medical staff is following those bylaws um, every time they're engaging in those processes um, and documenting those steps, because it's not enough just to follow them if you can't prove that you followed them later uh, you know, with minutes or with notes of interviews, things of that nature. That makes it more difficult to prove, obviously, that you should get the immunity or the privilege protections. You want to make sure that your bylaws are actually outlining the processes. It's not only helpful for you as the hospital um, or the, the the entity, it's helpful for the physician. Any ever, It's helpful for everyone in the process to know exactly what are the deadlines, what is the process. It should be laid out much like our civil procedure rules is what you're going to want to see in your bylaws. Obviously, you want to... You, just like our civil procedure rules, you want some some escape hatches to say that, you know, the parties can agree differently, uh, things of that nature. But you want to make sure that they're also not going out so long, because this is a process that not only the physician wants to wrap up quickly, um, you do as well, because you don't want someone hanging around if you're wanting to, to get them off the medical staff. But also, you got to give them sufficient time to get outside experts. You may need to get um, outside peer reviewers to look at things. So it's finding that balance um, for the timing. Um, you want to make sure, obviously, that you have a written decision from the hearing panel. And always, the board has to be that final stop in the process. It always has to end up with the board. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to want to consider you know, employment versus peer review options. Uh, and there may be a variety of considerations as to what you would do in a particular circumstance. 
And then also we didn't get into this at all today with our time, but National Practitioner Data Bank reporting, um, if you have any questions about that, the guidebook, the National Practitioner Data Bank guidebook, which is online, is fabulous. It walks through when you should do what and has examples um, of situations. Um, generally speaking, where you kind of often will get into a hang up is if you're you're affecting someone's privileges for 30 days, that's when it starts to trigger um, National Practitioner Data Bank reporting, both from a temporary or a permanent perspective. Um, so if, if you are taking limits that are lasting more than 30 days, either at the beginning of an investigation or later, those are things where you need to be looking at. Are you under some requirement to report to the National Practitioner Data Bank? Before you, before Alan takes off, maybe any questions from the from the House? I have one question. Don't make it too hard. I hope it's not too hard because <laughs> I didn't. This is not this is not a plan. I genuinely came up with this question. Um, you mentioned that Minnesota, at least some cases, have have found that the peer review, or I'm sorry, the the bylaws. Mm -hmm. Or a contract yes. that could give a physician or a provider a cause of action for violation. Correct. Um, if you know or if you have thoughts on it, are, is there anything in those cases, in the analysis of those cases, that suggests that the um, the institution could influence that one way or another? In other words, does that the the conclusion that it's a contract does that turn on particular traits of the bylaws, or is that just I, per se. I think it seems sort of per se. I mean, it did go through the analysis of look, it sets it sets the physician's requirements, it sets the hospital's requirements, it has the traditional uh things of a contract. You know, there's consideration. If you want to be a part of this the staff, you've got to, you know, you've got to agree to this by law. If we want you to be part of this, you know, you offer it to them mm -hmm. as part of their privileges. Um, so that is how the court analyzed it was just sort of traditional contract principle. Like then. it sounds similar to how sometimes we see courts analyze whether like an employee handbook. Correct. Yes. And they did actually, the case that I read, they did actually kind of use that as a reference that, you know, it's similar to what you would, the similar analysis to what you do with an employee handbook. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to talk about the peer review protection, which dovetails significantly with the topics that Becky discussed. Um, a lot of people are familiar generally with the peer review protection. Uh, you'll often hear it referred to as the peer review privilege. In Minnesota, at least, uh, that is a misnomer. Uh, Minnesota is a statutory mandated confidentiality protection, and it's one of the broadest uh, that I personally am aware of, and I'm excited to talk about it. Um, it, it matters for a variety of reasons. It is the thing that ensures uh, confidentiality of client information when they're discussing quality issues. It is uh, often something that comes in kind of collaterally in cases. Um, I've been in court, for instance, on um, a third party trial subpoena where somebody wanted some information that was part of the peer review process and we had to move to quash because you cannot get that under all but one specific circumstance. So I'm going to talk about peer review protection generally. I'm going to look closely at Minnesota's peer review protection statute, and then I'm going to provide some best practices for protecting peer review information, both in discovery and trial. So peer review, what is it? We all, I think, have some sense, but essentially it is the principal method that we use to evaluate the quality of patient care. Um, it is a confidential means by which Physicians get together to discuss the care of other physicians or care providers get together to discuss the care of other providers. Um, it, it, it's sort of um, conceptually really familiar or, or has a lot of um, similarities with subsequent remedial measures. Um, you're allowed to discuss improvements. You're allowed to criticize openly and in a candid fashion. And in so doing, you are shielded from later divulging that criticism in uh, pretty much all most circumstances. It can occur in many settings. Um, hospital, most hospitals have uh, mandated peer review, very formal processes. If they don't, they should. Uh, but it also happens in medical societies, managed care organizations, and a whole host of other settings. So while this is probably most relevant to the hospital process, it certainly is not only relevant to the hospital process. Um, and there's this nice quotation from the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. Peer review serves as one of medicine's most effective risk management and quality improvement tools and provides a safe form in which medical professionals can review the quality of care and work to reduce medical errors. 
key key phrase is safe form. It's safe. You can say what you need to say to improve patient care. Peer review protection is a creature of state law. There is no um, federal peer review protection, and so it varies by jurisdiction. Some are very robust, some are not. Some are limited to specific situations, some are very global. So it's important to note the jurisdictions in which you operate and know what the peer review requirements are. Uh, many of our clients are multi-jurisdictional, but they have one peer review process. Um, that may be opening yourself up to uh, a accidental divulging of confidential information. Like I said before, at least in Minnesota, it is not a privilege. Um, and the, imp the implication of that, although there is some gray area, is that it can't be waived. It's a statutory protection that uh, adheres to your information, regardless of whether you accidentally disclose it. Um, so Minnesota's peer review statute, I'm going to go over this in some detail. Um, Many of our clients use this statute, which is why um, I think it will be most relevant for our discussion today. I really encourage you, though, to look at the statutes in the jurisdictions that, that you are in to make sure that you understand them and to tailor your procedures accordingly. Um, so Minnesota's uh, proceeds in six sections. One has definitions. One provides immunity for those who supply information to the peer review process. One provides immunity for those who perform the peer review process. One discusses confidentiality of data or information acquired in the peer review process. Um, there's another se section that deals exclusively with guidelines. Um, guidelines with respect to particular norms, standards of care, um, recommendations, those are not admissible into evidence if they're developed by the peer review process. And finally, at least in Minnesota, unauthorized disclosure is a misdemeanor. Um, so not only is it something that cannot accidentally be waived, if you do accidentally disclose it, you can be charged with a misdemeanor in Minnesota. Um, I looked and I was not able to find any record of that actually happening, um, but that's a threat. And that is a significant argument that you can present to the court as to why your client's information really is material um, and can't be disclosed. Because if you have a witness who's disclosing peer review protected information, they're arguably subjecting themselves to a misdemeanor. Um, and I had one recent case where I had to consider whether I was going to instruct the witness to take the fifth. Um, well, ultimately, we did not have to do that. But I, I say that um, with a little bit of jest that the law really has a solemnity about the value of this information. Um, and I'm not aware of any other healthcare um, protection anyway that has the same onus in Minnesota. I, I would, I would, I'm just gilding the lily here, Alan, but I would add, I, in all my years of doing this, I've never seen or heard of someone being charged under that statute, <laughs> but I agree. It adds a certain uh, gravitas uh, to, to any argument about it to say, look, I mean, we're not just making this up, man. This is, this is a crime. Um, so, so in Minnesota, um, review organization is the term of art that we use to describe the organization that conducts peer review. Um, the, the statute is quite lengthy, so I encourage anyone who's who's really interested in this to look at that statute. It's very broad. It's quite expansive, and you can probably fit yourself into it in some fashion or another so long as you're careful and mindful of it. Boiled down to its essentials, it is four things. A committee. Peer review is not one person. It is a, it is a legislature. It is a collection of people um, composed of professionals and staff, and that's important as well. You have to make sure that the composition of your peer review process is consistent with the statutory definition. Um, so if you have a bunch of non-professionals, th that may take your peer review process out of the statutory protection. So you wanna ensure that if you are having um, critical decisions of medical providers, that medical providers are at least part of that committee that is providing the input. Um, it's got to be established by a healthcare organization. The statute is very expansive on what, what is a healthcare organization. Um, and it's everything from the typical settings you'd expect, like hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, um, to there's the 16 separate sub entities that I, honestly, I'm not even sure I understand what all of them are, <laughs> but they're quite, um, expansive. This third one I put in quotations because it's important. Um, the purpose of the committee must be to review information related to patient care and treatment. Um, and that is kind of at a high level what a court will look at when they're saying, well, was, was this really peer review? Was it not peer review? What was the purpose of it? 
And if it's to review information relating to patient care and treatment, it's more likely to be found in the ambit of the peer review protection. And then there's a specific kind of sub-purpose. Not only are you looking at patient information relating to patient care and treatment, but you're doing it for a specific reason. Um, I think the statute enumerates something like 18 specific region, re reasons. Um, the most important one probably is the first, evaluating and improving the quality of healthcare, um, but I'll also call your attention to you know, guidelines, to D, developing and publishing guidelines showing the norms of healthcare, a quality review oriented toward just looking at general safety, quality, even cost of services. Um, if you're looking at you know, whether your pricing and costs are appropriate, you are arguably within the peer review structure so long as you're observing the norms, at least in Minnesota. Um, Becky has already talked about this at length, but determining whether or not a professional should be granted staff privileges. And then finally, um, of particular interest to me, uh, reviewing, ruling on, or advising disputes or questions, subcategory J. There's a litany of different actors here, um, and it covers a lot of the disputes that uh, we litigate as, as lawyers here in our practice. Um, disputes between providers and patients, disputes between hospitals and um, particular provider groups, disputes between patients and those provider groups, disputes between some of those actors and payers. Um, a lot of different disputes can arguably be understood to be consistent with the review organization statute. And so that is an opportunity for organizations to claim a bit more confidentiality over their data than they might currently anticipate. Um, on to immunity. So there's two uh, statutes that discuss immunity. I'm not going to read these to you. They're fairly straightforward. You have immunity if you give organization to a peer review organization. You have immunity if you perform the duties, functions, or activities of the peer review organization. Now, there should probably be an asterisk here because there is one important exception that Becky has already touched on, and that is unless such information is false and the person providing such information knew or had reason to believe such information was false. I'm not familiar with any case interpreting that provision of the statute, but it suggests there is somewhat of a intentional or reckless disregard to enter standard for providing information to a review organization in bad faith. Um, the more I think the one that I am familiar with being litigated and ruled on is the latter provision here, and that is the performance of which and Last last line, unless the performance of such duty, function, or activity was motivated by malice toward the person affected thereby. Malice is one of those words that comes to us from the old country. <laughs> and in this particular context, it is a, it's very important to note, the inquiry for malice is objective. It is not subjective. It is not what was in the person's heart or motivating them when they conducted the peer review process. It's an objective inquiry that focuses on, as Becky touched on, whether or not you followed your normal procedures. If you follow your normal procedures, you are not malice. Conversely, if you do not and you wildly depart from your normal procedures, it is more likely that a court will find or a fact finder will find malice. And so that is a significant um, exception that's built into the statute. And it's one that so long as you procedurally protect yourself, you should not be liable for it. So this one is probably the most important uh, aspect of the peer review pro protection, pardon me, uh, in, at least in my practice, and that is confidentiality with respect to data and information. So the, the language here is key, and I've excerpted what I think is the, is the key language. So data and information acquired by, doesn't say created by, it says acquired by. So if information comes to the peer review process, it is protected from any kind of disclosure. It shall be held in confidence. It shall not be disclosed to anyone. It shall not be subject to subpoena or discovery. That is emphatic language that at least in Minnesota, this information is off limits for litigation. It is a hard stop. No person shall disclose what transpired at a review meeting. Um, the proceedings and records shall not be admitted into evidence in an action against a professional arising out of the matter or matter which are the subject of consideration by the review organization. Basically, in a malpractice case or a similar 
allegation against a professional, the peer review deliberations, conversations, communications about that topic will never come into evidence. And then finally, a witness cannot be asked about testimony before a review organization or any opinions formed by the witness as a result of its hearings. Now, the language here is a little gray and there is some play in the joints, but essentially the broad reading of this is anything you learn as part of the peer review process cannot be disclosed in a litigation. Now, there's one exception, um, two exceptions rather, and that is the original source of, of exception, which we should be familiar with from other areas of the law, but essentially you can't funnel something to the peer review process and bury it. It is still discoverable from its original source. Um, and so you can take a subpoena of someone and ask them what they knew other than the peer review process, and they would be bound to testify about that, even if they supply that information to the peer review process. Same thing with documents. You can get documents from their original sources, even if those documents eventually made their hands or made their way into the hands of a peer review organization. So like one boneheaded example, right? Patient's medical record. The peer review organization might, might look at that, but obviously that record, absent the peer review, exactly. is still discoverable on its own terms. That's exactly right. Now there is one nuance, which is once you give it to the peer review, the, you can't take it away from the peer review's files. Um, and so you cannot get discovery from the peer review organization. You still can from the original source. So in the medical records example, presumably the medical record is not maintained in the exclusive possession, custody, and control of the peer review committee. Um, that would present an interesting issue if that were the case, um, <laughs> but I'm not familiar with any such thing. Um, but yeah, from the original source, it's discoverable. The second one, uh, and the one that's been the subject of some litigation, is the provider data exception. And that is... A provider can get his or her own peer review files when challenging an action that was adverse to them. So hospital A cuts physician B's privileges. Physician B can ask hospital A for her peer review file with respect to that decision. Um, that is the only reason, or pardon me, the only basis that peer review information can be disclosed. Um, so while that is a significant exception, if you're in that scenario, Otherwise, peer review is off limits. I think I mentioned this before, pretty straightforward. Guidelines are inadmissible. Um, so if a review organization comes up with their own standards, guidelines, um, that is not admissible into evidence. It is still discoverable. Um, so that is something to be aware of. Um, it's kind of an interesting quandary in the law. I don't know why it would be discoverable. If it can't be admissible, it seems of limited value. But that is the way that the courts have come down on that. Um, and I did not. And I don't want to step in your toes on that one, Alan, if you've got more, yep. but that's something that's near that comes up in my practice a lot. And I would just emphasize here that for those who aren't familiar with this provision and sort of what it means, and, and I think this touches on a broader theme that you're making clear, how broad the language of the statute is, right? Because of the way that the statute defines a review organization broadly, um, and I, I guess I'll confess, as I sit here, I don't recall if it, if it expressly defines the term guideline, but in practice, this provision applies to a massive world of policies, procedures, written um, documents, and so forth that, that medical providers, hospitals, health systems, whatever, generate all the time about how to do things right, right? And I think the theory behind behind protecting this uh, th those materials in a, um, you know, this is obviously focused, you see the statutory language, this is focused on professional malpractice actions, right? The theory is we don't want providers to have their written guidelines used against them. Otherwise, they won't write them down, <laughs> right? It's the same concept that drives the whole statute and the subsequent remedial measures rule and the rules of evidence. Um, and so the law privileges, or I should say, protects those guidelines because we want to encourage, for example, physicians to write down, like, this is the best procedure to deal with this particular medical condition, and yet not be afraid that later on they are going to be found liable for malpractice if they departed from that procedure in some way. Um, it's a really powerful protection, but it's important that those engaged in this litigation be aware of it so that you can, as you say, this stuff is discoverable. And so 
you know, typically my clients don't, my clients typically produce it in discovery when it's asked for, but subject to very clear objections to its admissibility. Um, and it sometimes surprises, for example, plaintiff's lawyers from other jurisdictions who think they've got a great case because somebody didn't precisely comply with like a written protocol. And it's, it turns out it's not admissible at all. And it, it usually ends up, it, it can help shape the issues in a, in a malpractice case, or it may influence how, for example, experts look at matters, but they should never be allowed to come into court and testify that, you know, physician X didn't follow the guideline at that hospital and therefore they committed malpractice. Um, so very, very important to be aware of. It's somewhat fascinating to me. This seems uh, in tension completely with the confidentiality provision that we just looked at, right? That stuff is confidential, confidential, confidential. Yet here, there's a carve out for admissible. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is, um, but yeah, that's an interesting, sure right. it's an interesting exception that the statute has made. So lessons from some of the cases, um, I've, I've touched on probably some of these before. Um, there's this Warwick case from 1980. Basically, the implication from that case is that a peer review protection cannot be waived. The statute makes some, certain things inadmissible. Uh, I think in this particular case, uh, party one of the parties put something on their exhibit list that should have been deemed peer review protected. Um, and they forgot to make that objection, or they did not in the initial go round at least make the objection. Trial begins, and party B says, hey, wait a second, that's peer review protected, that can't come into evidence. And the court agreed. The court said, it doesn't matter that you didn't object uh, at, during your first turn. It's inadmissible per the statute, and that statutory mandate trumps any suggestion of waiver in this instance. Um, the Conradi case goes to a, re a review organization. Um, that case dealt with a, a hospital or a IRB board, an internal review board, and basically the IRB was to you know make sure that the experiment or testing, what have you, that had human subjects was to be safe and was going to monitor the conditions and and so forth associated with whatever the proposal was. And the, the court said, no, that's not a review organization. The primary purpose there isn't patient safety and quality. It's human safety in the context of this testing, but, but not patient safety and quality in the way that the statute contemplates. I think the most significant decision is the Amaro case from the Supreme Court uh, from 1999. That case involved a request by a couple of physicians at a hospital to see their peer review records. They hadn't had any adverse action against them. They just wanted to see what was there. They said, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, I want to look at my peer review file to see what the contents are. Um, and I forget what their motivation was, but it was not, they were not victims of an adverse finding against them. And the court said, no, the statute is very clear that peer review information is only discoverable under the private provider data exception in an action to ch challenge an, an adverse determination. Um, and there's been no subsequent broadening of the peer review protection since this case. So this case stands for the proposition that peer review protected information can only arise in this context. Um, another significant case, the Fairview University Medical Center case, that is um, also 1999 case. Um, this one held that information held within all peer review files is protected, even if it's not generated by the peer review organization. Uh, there, the Board of Medical Practice sent a subpoena for the credentialing files of a couple of physicians, I believe, and um, the hospital said, no, this stuff is peer reviewed. We're not going to give it to you. And there was litigation, and the board said, number one, that that protection only applies in a civil action. It doesn't apply when you know a board is enforcing its licensing jurisdiction. Court said no, it applies. Period. And second, they said, well, there's the original source exception. We're allowed to discover this stuff unless the the, the peer review organization made it. And the court said, no, you're not. You can get it from the original sources, and we don't care if you don't know who the original sources are. This is the statute. This public policy interest trumps any individual interest in this dispute. Um, this is sacrosanct, and we are not going to disturb the judgment of the legislature. Uh, the Larson versus Wassmiller case, this one is another, you know, it's funny, of course, we'll recognize things that are associated with the peer review, but they are steadfast in defending the protection that adheres to the peer review. In this case, the court recognized a negligent credentialing claim, but it held 
peer review materials are not discoverable. And there's a lengthy concurrence by Justice Anderson saying, well, it's going to be pretty hard for parties to prove or defend their negligent credentialing claim, but that's that's the law as we know it. Um, and finally, the, the Dam Guard v. Avery Health case basically held that hospital policies are not admissible as evidence of the relevant standard of care. So not just guidelines, but policies, uh, broadening some of that language from uh, subsection 14565. All right, so it's best we got about 10 minutes. I want to talk about best practices. Yes, Mr. Ebnett. <laughs> One of the things that I see in my practice more and more is emails between providers in anticipation of a peer review uh, conference or an M&M &M conference. And I'm wondering if any of those cases you just covered or your, your good judgment here can help me understand what the best argument might be for protecting the email correspondence between providers in anticipation of a peer review setting. So the question is, with respect to emails between providers in anticipation of a peer review, might the protection apply? And if so, why? Uh, I, I think it could vary, to be candid. I mean, the, the statute says the peer review process is won by a committee for the purposes of the quality review. And you could make arguments in either case, right? Yes, this was a communication in furtherance of that process. This was a communication among members of the peer review committee to the peer review committee at the behest of the peer review committee. Um, and it was for the purpose of, you know, patient quality and treatment. So I think it would be a context specific inquiry. Um, you know, one of my, I, I will talk about this further. A big thing is to observe rigorous procedural formalities in this peer review context. If you do that, you should be fine. If you don't, and it's said, then this could depend on the context, right? If it's an ad hoc, you know, provider to provider email, hey, did you see, you know, we, we were looking at Dr. So and so's care. If it's if it's out of the committee and it's sort of this ad hoc communication, there's a risk. Um, so it's important when you do peer review to do it right. And um, I'm going to talk about a few things. Did that answer your question? Okay. Alan, I can jump in. I because I've come across this also during discovery. And my practice has been to assert it wherever you can. Um, I haven't gotten any challenges on that in the past, but, um, and you might be talking about this in best practices where it gets really dicey is you can't tell from the email what context it is in um, because it's not properly labeled. So that has been the bane of my existence in discovery is, is it peer review? Yeah. Because so there's not on, enough information. I think multiple of my, my tips. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, take a broad approach to what constitutes peer review. While it's important to make sure that you're formally protected, the statute is broad and your interpretation should be broad too. I think where there's ambiguity, take the high ground. Um, you're, you're more likely to protect your information. And if you do the other things on this list, you should have a pretty good assurance that it will be protected. Um, similarly, Use the peer review committee expressly to deliberate and, and decide things that you think should be confidential, um, it, assuming they're appropriate. Um, if you need to do a root cause analysis, if you do it outside the peer review committee structure, it may be discoverable. If you do it inside the peer review committee structure, it should not be discoverable. Um, and so you can use the structural protections afforded by the statute to keep information confidential. Three, develop and use formal procedures. We've sort of dovetailed on that or talked about this a little bit, but the more formal and rigorous your procedures are, the more likely it will be the court will find, yeah, this was done in the peer review committee context or the peer review protected context. It's not discoverable. And that's where I think the random e emails that are not clearly, it's unclear whether or not they're peer review committee communications or not, that's where there's risk. Um, number four, if you have procedures, you need to consistently adhere to them. Why? If you don't, you open yourself up to liability for acting with malice. Um, and so make sure that those in your organization who are charged with peer review know what the procedures are and that there is a rigorous compliance with those procedures. If, as you're looking at your peer review process, you notice that there are gaps between what your process is and what you actually do, you should fix that. Um, and you should do it now. And so that's a big opportunity for clients to improve their risk mitigation. Number five, ensure that you treat peer review information like peer review information. 
So sequester it. Don't intermingle it in the email inboxes of all your employees. If you keep it electronically, keep it in one spot. If you keep it in a physical spot, physical file, keep it that way. Um, make sure however you keep it, you are consistent and rigorous about it. Sim similar concept, maintain peer view protected information in the same spot, right? If you put it in one folder on your shared drive that no one can access except people who are charged with completing the peer review function. This is the most obvious one, but the one I see often not done. So I'm going to say it two times. <laughs> Label your peer review information. Label your peer review information. No downside. Uh, no downside. All you have to do is put something on there that makes clear that it is information that was acquired by the peer review process, right? Does, doesn't have to be generated, although if it is generated, then put that on there as well. Just make it express that this is a peer review document. Um, and then D, while you technically should not be able to waive peer review, you risk doing so if you're talking about it outside of peer review. I had a case that involved text messages outside of peer review, and it was between members of the peer review committee. And the question was, well, is this, was this a peer review communication or was it a, a quasi defamatory communication? And we had to have a long colloquy. Ultimately, the facts showed that it was a communication that was made in the context of peer review. Um, but you can get around that if you limit your communications to the actual formal peer review setting. Finally, be mindful of the different peer review protections across jurisdictions. Like I said before, if you are if you operate in multiple jurisdictions, you need to be aware of the peer review protections that apply to you and make sure that you're complying them. Otherwise, you got holes in your process. And then in litigation, vigorously assert this, like Vanessa said, consider whether or not this is a objection you can make to a discovery request. And if if you need to be prepared to fight the issue, um, and this is one of my experience that um, institution and clients are quite bullish to push back on because it affects what they do and is a core of their business. Um, and one concluding quotation, you know, we get as litigators, I like the sport and the tactics of litigation. That is something that gets me up in the morning. I enjoy that. <laughs> but the peer review process is important to recall is rooted in the public interest. And it is above the day-to-day -day pedestrian squabbles of any individual case. It is legitimately a, a decision our legislature has made to ensure that we get better and that we're getting the best quality of healthcare. And so there's this nice quotation from uh, Justice Anderson's concurrence in the Larson case. Review by one's peers within a hospital is not only time consuming, unpaid work, it is also likely to generate bad feelings and result in unpopularity. If lawsuits by unhappy reviewers reviewees can easily follow any decision, then the peer review demanded by the law will become an empty formality if undertaken at all. And that, I think, is something you can advocate for vigilantly if you are faced with attacks on your peer review process. The purpose of this protection is to ensure that peer review protection, peer review process goes on and can make healthcare better. And if um, there are holes to allowed in the dam, uh, the, the, the whole dam will collapse. And that's why the legislature has made a black and white decision. This is protected information, full stop. And with that, I think that concludes <laughs> our presentation. I, I'd, I'd like to add just questions. a little bit and before turning to questions from the group, if there are any, but, but just like one additional thought or two from a practical perspective, and this arises from you know, a fair number of years now of dealing with these issues in litigation. And this touches on Nate's question and the, the question of like some email between Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith, is it peer review or not? Um, my friends and, and clients on the provider side and the in-house side listening will forgive me if maybe you've already thought of this. I've been called Captain Obvious before, but what has struck me is like one of the fundamental problems in this area is that statutes and the peer review doctrine and all this are created by lawyers and judges. The actual stuff that happens is done by doctors. Frequently, they are ignorant of the law. Almost as frequently, they don't care about the law. <laughs> God bless them. It's just not what they're there for. Right. But the, the point here is that I have learned in many, and it, this particularly arises in larger institutions with, with pretty complex structure, departmental structures. The statute is, as you've very you know, well explained, Alan, the statute is very open textured. It's very broad just about i'm i'm fairly confident i could make a winning argument that two doctors meeting over lunch in the cafeteria and talking about a case that went wrong could be peer review 
And so what actually happens in practice is that if you have, for example, a larger, a larger um, healthcare system that has, you know, a department of surgery and then a, you know, a division of orthopedic surgery or whatever, subdivisions, a given surgeon on his or her service might have a peer review thing that they do. They meet with the people once a week and they do peer review, but they don't even know it. They don't know it's peer review. They just do it. And then they might have morbidity mortality review within the division. Then they might have a departmental review, right? There's all these layers of review and none of them are really thinking about is this peer review that's going to be protected they're just sending emails um and so one of the things that i think the lawyers in-house can do and it's a big ask honestly it's not easy to do i get it but the more that you can educate your physicians and your providers about why this matters the better the if you will hygiene will be in terms of when they're sending emails and why and the better things will be on the back end because it's hard. Not every peer review committee has the label peer review committee, right? And um, by the same token, I found in, I mean, double digits of depositions of provider clients where despite having asked like 10 times in prepping the, case, the, the matter, if there was peer review, something comes out in a deposition where they're like, oh, well, I did talk to Dr. Jones about blah, blah, blah. And on, in the moment, you're having to figure out whether this is peer review, it's new information. It's troublesome. And so for the same reasons they don't understand when they're sending the emails, you've got to ask people, ask providers involved in cases like 15 times, who did you talk to? And you can't say, and you'll go, did, was there any peer review in this case? And they're like, nah. And like two weeks later, you find out they talked to 15 different people and every one of them is peer review in some way. So you can't just say, was there peer review? You've got to understand everything that happened and then you do the application of the facts to figure out if it applies. So that's a bit of a rant, sorry. Um, but practical practical tips. Yeah, well, um, related to that, if you do have a case with discovery, you know, oftentimes medical malpractice cases, you you can mostly limit it just to the medical record subject to what I think Andrew's gonna talk about in yeah. a little bit. Um, but when you're starting to get into the squishier types of litigation, both in-house and outside counsel, trying to be cognizant that there it's possible something could pop up that's peer review and making sure the more junior lawyers on the case who are digging into the documents more deeply are also aware of it. Yeah. One, so if there is something stamped with that statute, they know to flag it so that you don't produce it and to be aware of it in case you have that one-off email um, that they can keep it out of discovery um, by flagging it for the, for the team. And, you know, maybe you do need to ask more questions and, and get yeah. more information. Absolutely. And, and in litigation, you know, especially if you're dealing with opposing counsel in other jurisdictions, they don't know about it. If they don't work in healthcare, they don't even know about peer review. And if they're in a different jurisdiction, they may have a different statute and a different perspective on it. So, um, assume it is until proven otherwise, I guess it's one of the lessons. Um, and you'll do, you'll do just fine. Uh, we are at the end of our first session, but we have a we have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Another kind of practical. What do we do? Yeah. So guidelines, policies, procedures are discoverable, not evidence. Yeah. What do you do? What do you think is best practice when there's a plaintiff's lawyer holding it and asking your client questions on the other side of the table? Do you is that allowed? Yeah. If they're not putting it in as evidence. They'll point out they're not putting it in as evidence, but they're reading the whole thing in and asking the question. To yeah, my practice. Great question. My practice is just make an objection on the record in the deposition. I don't frankly think you even need to, because I think at the end of the day, it's a motion in limine. But I, if I'm on my game, and I'm always, I'm just kidding. I'm always. <laughs> you know, I was going to say that. Um, no, if I'm on my game, I make the objection up front, and I basically say standing objection to everything you ask about this document. The great part about it is, like, if they don't, if they're un unaware of that provision, which most of them aren't, it's so deflating to them because they have like a whole line of questions. They're like, "You didn't comply with this document," and I'm like, it "Doesn't matter," and okay. they're like, oh, "Okay," and they lose interest. Um, I think that's all you can do. And I've I've occasionally filed motions in limine on these things, and I don't recall that I've ever even had a real fight about it because the statute is so clear. You're just like, it doesn't come in, judge, and you win. So it, like I said, it can color how the experts think about the case, and it can it and it can really bum out the witness too if they feel like they've not complied with a policy. The other thing I would add: many many organizations guideline and policies and whatnot, and this is kind of a best practice. Often say this is a guideline only. Clinical judgment must be used in every circumstance, and you sort of build in that padding that always says, "We're not robots; like we're we're healthcare providers, and we're always using our judgment." So that's how I deal with it. All right, we got a break. The next session begins at one fifteen. Thank you. We'll see you back here in a minute. <laughs>